safe to call this the Trump assassination attempt cover-up conspiracy. It should be the number one story in America. Number one with a bullet or perhaps without a bullet. And we'll get to the new details on this in a moment. First, clerical news. I said there would probably not be a podcast today. Some time opened up and this story was too good to pass up. The bullet story, the conspiracy story, why Trump has been lying about what hit his ear two weeks ago tomorrow in Butler, Pennsylvania. No, that is not actually the lead story. The lead story is Kamalot. Kamalot. That's Kaylee McEnany's term. She thinks it's a derogatory term regarding Kamala Harris. Kaylee McEnany also probably thinks derogatory is a kind of Zeppelin or blimp. Anyway, three new sets of polls indicating we may soon be living in Kamalot. The New York Times, you may know about. Likely voters are now 48 Trump, 47 Harris, which sounds eh, good. July 2nd, you may recall that the Times terrified the entirety of liberal America by reporting it was Trump 49, Biden 43. That means simply by being Kamala Harris, she has taken away five points from what had been a six-point Trump lead, and that is with Trump's convention bounce and whatever bounce he got after being hit in the ear with a, a paper clip, bottle cap, hardened bubble gum, something. And the three-way race, the results in the Times may be even more interesting. Trump, 42, Harris, 42, Kennedy, 6. Apparently his lowest number in their poll yet. Kennedy is bailing water. I'll go into this next week, but I wouldn't be a bit surprised if Kennedy essentially sells his operation to Trump. He's already pitched him for some sort of position in a Trump cabinet. Trump may have no other choice but to accept the Kennedy pitch and bribe Kennedy to endorse him and drop out. The other numbers from the Times. Harris's favorability is now 46 percent. In February, in the Times poll, Harris's favorability was 36 percent. So she gained 10 points, not 10 percent, but 10 points from a third to nearly half based on being the presidential nominee. And if you're wondering if this was the right move as perceived by America's voters of all stripes, the Times says 88 percent of all voters agreed with Joe Biden withdrawing. Also yesterday, there was a morning consult poll. Morning consult, fairly reliable. It now has Harris ahead, 46-45, ahead among independents, 40 to 38. They have her retaining 87 percent of Biden's 2020 voters and 4% of Trump's 2020 voters. And as I have theorized many times, what percentage of Trump's 2020 voters don't vote for him in 2024 may decide this election. Also, the black vote, forgive the use of that term, is now Kamala Harris's by 70 to 19, and the 19 is sinking. Also, change polls. I don't know much about change polls, except they changed. Biden had trailed Trump by four. Harris leads Trump by one. And for those of you who can't add, that's a five-point swing in favor of Kamala Harris on her fourth day, fourth weekday of her campaign. These are good numbers. By the way, back to the New York Times. Times is gonna times. This is beyond belief, except something has gone desperately wrong at the New York Times. Some fundamental baseline level of journalism has evaporated. They don't know what they're doing anymore. They are so blinded. They don't know what they're doing anymore. This was in the article about their own poll showing either a tie in a three-way race or a situation in which Kamala Harris has cut the Trump lead to one point by virtue of being Kamala Harris. This is what they originally had. Quote, I'm a Democrat, but I've changed my mind after everything that's happened with Joe Biden's administration, said Anna Ayala, a 58-year-old who lives in San Jose, California, and voted for Mr. Biden in 2020. She plans to vote for Mr. Trump in 2024. Quote, I mean, the border situation is out of control. 
As The Atlantic noted, Anna Ayala has been in the news before. She was the confidence trickster, a recidivist confidence trickster, who went to prison for several years for having publicly claimed that she had found a human finger in her chili at a famous fast food brand restaurant. She went public. She demanded money. She damaged the brand so badly that I won't even repeat the name of the brand now. And then it turned out a rather simple examination proved that the chili had been correctly cooked, but the finger had not been cooked. She had put the finger in the chili. She had bought, as it turned out, the finger from her husband's business partner who had lost it in some kind of industrial accident. Police were led to this conclusion by an anonymous tip that turned out to be from her husband's business partner who was missing the anonymous tip of his finger. The New York Times, so desperate to find and include in its positive towards Harris and the Democrats article a disaffected Democrat, so defensive about the beating it has properly received throughout the entirety of this campaign, the Times didn't even bother to do what I do with every name I don't know as I'm preparing these little stinking podcasts. Just Google them. You never know what you're going to find. You may find something that completely destroys your intent and you can't mention something. Or it turns out the statement has been retracted. Or it turns out the person you're talking about claimed that there was a finger in her chili. Is that a finger in your chili or are you just glad to see me, Miss Ayala? The Times quoted the story or quoted her without checking anything. And then talk about getting something cut out, they cut the reference to Anna Ayala out of the story and issued some non-denial denial that they screwed up completely. The Times, the New York goddamned Times, the holy goddamned New York Times, as was said by Robert Duval in Network, now literally giving America the finger. Now, to the subject of Trump and the magic bullet that is so magic it may never have come close to him. We had Wednesday, and it escaped notice because it is clear now that the media news organizations, the main ones in this country, are completely ignoring this story. When they touch it, they attribute the idea that Trump was hit by a bullet to Trump. They say he says he was hit by a bullet. They offer no contradictory evidence, nor any confirmatory evidence. They are avoiding this story out of terror of retribution. If the Republicans have worked the refs since about 1990, this is where it pays off. If Trump has threatened the lives of reporters since 2015, indirectly, stochastically, this is where it pays off. They are afraid to touch the story. And yet, Wednesday night, getting no publicity until yesterday, the head of the FBI, Christopher Wray, ironically answering questions in front of a House committee, answering the questions of Jim Jordan, gave away the ball game. As of right now, the FBI has no effing clue what Trump was hit by. I think with, uh, with respect to former President Trump, um, there's, it, there's some question about whether or not uh, it's a bullet or shrapnel that, you know, that hit his ear. So it's, it's conceivable, although as I sit here right now, I don't know whether that bullet, in addition to you know, causing the grazing, could have also landed somewhere else. Um, but I believe we've accounted for all of the shots and the cartridges. Christopher Ray's statement was immediately attacked by former sort of Dr. Ronnie Jackson, the Trumpist psychopath from Texas, now serving in Congress because that's where we're keeping our crazy people these days who decried what Ray said and said, I saw the wound. He is the only person outside of Trump who says that Trump was hit by a bullet. And yes, he saw the wound after he flew overnight to see Trump in New Jersey on Sunday. We have no idea. We have no idea what happened in the interim. We have no idea who treated Trump. We have no idea what he was treated for. 
I believe we've been told he has not received any stitches, and all we know is that he had something that looked like a communicator earpiece from the original Star Trek over his ear in public at the convention, and then suddenly he didn't even have a freaking Band-Aid. There is a conspiracy to cover this up. I went at length yesterday or the day before about why they would do such a thing. The idea that Trump was the victim of an assassination attempt is not disputed, and to you and I is a serious matter no matter who the target might be nor what we feel about Don Old Trump. For us, it's not in question. For his own supporters, if he dived under a lectern to avoid a bullet or another bullet after one had grazed his ear, he is a hero who took a bullet for democracy. To them, if he dived under a lectern to avoid shrapnel, in Mr. Ray's words, debris, a piece of plastic, it has been speculated that something hit the sound equipment on stage with him, and that's what struck him in the ear. If he did that, he's a coward. To them. You and I see no difference whatsoever. You and I would do exactly what Trump did. There was a moment in there where we were all human beings looking at another human being about to get shot and killed and getting the F out of the way. You would do it. I would do it. There is no shame in it to the Republicans, to the Trumpists who believe he is some sort of Christ-like figure. It must be a bullet or their entire belief system collapses. In fact, Ronnie Jackson, as it turns out, in another soundbite that had completely eluded me, and I apologize for this, Ronnie Jackson gave evidence, inadvertently, that it might not have been a bullet after all. He said, according to an interview with Nexstar from that convention nearly two weeks ago, his nephew suffered a minor injury after, quote, a bullet or a fragment of a bullet or something grazed his neck. He didn't notice it right away, but someone else in the crowd did, took him to the medical tent, it was a very minor injury, not a big deal. The nephew, according to Jackson, was sitting in the friends and family section when the shots rang out. This would have been roughly the area where the four Pittsburgh policemen were hit by shrapnel, plastic perhaps, maybe a piece of glass, and suffered minor injuries that did not really need medical attention. It's very simple. There were bullets fired. They did not hit Trump. He was hit by things that the bullets did hit. It's an assassination attempt. It, in their twisted minds, should count. Somehow it doesn't. Here is what Ronnie Jackson said now nearly two weeks ago. It was your nephew, right? That was right, my nephew. They, uh, they, they'd wanted to go to Trump rally for a while, so I got them tickets, and they went and they put them in the friends and family section, which happened to be the worst section to be in, pretty much. Uh, either that or the people right directly behind the president. Those are two bad spots to be. But um, the, 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 the uh, trajectory of the bullets were coming uh, right across uh, the top of their heads and, and down into that section, unfortunately. And uh, a bullet or a fragment of bullet or something grazed his neck, and he was bleeding a little bit from his neck. He didn't notice it right away, but someone else in the crowd did. Took him to the uh, medical the medical tent, mm -hmm. and uh, he was okay. He's fine. It was a it was a very minor injury, not a big deal. The Trump assassination attempt cover up conspiracy. I'm not looking for it on any of the Sunday talk shows. That's one of the reasons I did this podcast. A couple of other stories. The news from David Korn at Mother Jones, who's always got something cooking. J.D. Vance endorsed a book that calls progressives unhumans, U-N-H-U-M-A-N-S, unhumans, and praises the January 6th rioters, a book written by nothing less than Jack Posobiec. So we have a combined IQ here of about, let's see, 45 from the author and 40 from the other guy. That's 85... Between this and the couch and his negative poll numbers, as Trump would spell it, P-O-L-E, Trump's going to wind up dropping this guy. He's going to wind up dropping this guy. This guy is going to take Trump down if Trump has not already been taken down by having him here. Their latest angle is, and his latest angle is, a clip of Vance criticizing Kamala Harris for being childless and the Republicans rushing to his defense. Blake Masters, the guy with the crazy stare who ran for Senate in Arizona. Blake Masters, political leaders should have children. Certainly they should at least be married. If you aren't running or can't run a household of your own, how can you relate to a constituency of families or govern wisely with respect to future generations? Skin in the game matters. Three questions, Blake Masters. Tim Scott, 
Lindsey Graham, and of course, George Washington. George Washington, like Kamala Harris, was a step-parent, not a biological parent, as if that makes any difference to the raising of a child. George Washington had no children. There were always, however, children at his home at Mount Vernon. Martha Washington's two children from her previous marriage, he raised them as his own and her four grandchildren and some nieces and nephews. And Kamala Harris is, in fact, in the great tradition of George Washington. And let me ask you a question here, Blake Masters. Are you really smearing George Washington? If you're going to smear George Washington, bub, I'm going to ask you to step outside and we'll settle it there. And the last thing in this unexpected edition that you're welcome about, from the Associated Press... Melania Trump is writing a book. It's billed by her office as, quote, a powerful and inspiring story of a woman who has carved her own path, overcome adversity, and defined personal excellence. Who's it about? Oh, it's about Melania? It's some sort of book about her? About powerful and inspiring of a woman who has carved her own path? Let me me put it this way. Two things I don't think touched Donald Trump at any point in his life, or at least in the last couple of years. One, the bullet in Butler, Pennsylvania, and two, Melania. But a still better Melania joke from Covey93 on Twitter X. Quote, in her memoir, Melania Trump plans to write about how her experiences growing up on the south side of Chicago shaped her and how balancing work while raising two black young girls led her to where she is today. I've done all the damage I can do here. Back with a full episode on Tuesday, Bulletins as the News Warrants. Until then, I'm Keith Olbermann. Good morning, good afternoon, good night, and good luck.